Okay, well, um, Asushi? Yes. You are a very prolific filmmaker, I have to say. You are one of the few filmmakers in the world who are um, clearly very comfortable in making fictional film and documentary films. And the creative process of these two forms are actually quite different. One is based on creating kind of like a fictionalized world, whereas the other one is based on reality. So um, what is cinema to you then? And, and how do you depict a kind of a fair um, sense of reality in films? Um, yeah. Um, the, I, I've been making documentaries and I've been making fiction films uh, all the time and uh, I never felt uncomfortable doing either one. I always loved bo doing both. And uh, I enjoy making uh, fiction films, uh, working with the actors, and also I enjoy walking, after going to the location with the small camera, with no crew, just only by myself, and then talk to the people on the shoot there without no any script, just uh, just uh, you know play by ear and then fly on the wall. Then you know you just uh, uh, capture whatever you see. That's a documentary I, I shoot. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I think, from the huge frustration I always have, which is um, from the system of uh, the making documentaries or uh, the system of making uh, fiction films. Um, let me tell you more details. The, the system I mean is that when I make fictions, you have a bunch of actors, and you have uh, assistant directors, and you have uh, producers, and they tell you what to do this and do that. So the actors are more like, OK, I'm, uh, I'm going to show the really nice uh, re uh, emotional acting. Or, and then whenever I face with this, the actors and actresses in the, this movie making industry, sometimes I feel like I want to make a documentary of them. I don't want to make them read the lines on the script so they memorize everything. You know, like I really want to make them spontaneous. Say something they really came about this idea, then say, say whatever they think. So I really wanted to make a documentary about them. That's what I feel like on the set of uh, making fiction films. Then on the contrary, on the set of a documentary, it's not the set, actually, the, on the location. You go there, and sometimes you have a crew, like you have a cameraman or, you know, but a very few people, me and the cameraman and the sound person, three people maximum. Sometimes, most, most likely me, but uh, when I see the documentaries, uh, you see sometimes the documentary filmmakers go like, okay, this is the truth, true reality. So that's all it that matters. So you don't really care about the framing or the beauty of the shot. You just show the truth. That's, if that's a strong, then that, that, that makes a good documentary. But uh, sometimes that frustrated me. You can make a really beautiful shot while you are uh, sh uh, showing the truth too. You can do both. Reality can be beautiful too. Yes, reality is beautiful too. So, but uh, it's I I see sometimes the documentary filmmakers don't really care about the sh the composition of the shots. I do care about the composition of the shots, and then. The uh, also the editing of the shots too, you know. Look at the uh, cinema has got a uh, more than hundred years of history, and then there is a certain um, rhythm, which is very comfortable to the audience, from a wide shot to the close up, or close up when go to the pan, then you know, do this way, then go to the wide shot or something. There's a very there's a, some language, there's a film language, and there's a beauty of it. 
But uh, sometimes the, in the in the documentary filmmaking, they don't really care about those beauty. Like they can just do, if that's a truth that you can cut whatever you want, or you know even shaky camera. That's they don't care, really care. But I do care. I do care. I want the, I want to shoot a beautiful shot. I do I do care about the the editing, the the rhythm of the editing too. That's the, the that's the kind of uh, I think uh, craft. It's a craft of filmmaking. Craft, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the frustration I had when I made a documentary. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to make something between. <laughs> that's why like, I, I make documentaries too, and then I make fictions too. You and kind I, of sandwich them. Yes, I, I want to san sandwich them and then, then trying to find cinema in between. So that's, that's cinema to me. Okay. Something documentary-esque feeling on the set of fiction and the, the beautiful shot on the set of the, doc, the location of documentary. So that, that, mm. this, is, this is great because I like to actually ask you about Nuclear Nation and Cold Blue yeah. because those two films were very close to each other. Yes. I mean, the yes. production side. Yes, because and it's right after the March 11 both. You know? Yes. Yeah. And, and then there's the documentary film and the fictional film, but both films deal with survivors yes. of the tsunami. And how do they live with grief? What is the griefing process for them? Yeah. Um, and um, how did you, um, you probably have no difficulty in finding a common theme, right. but the treatment of the story would be very different, right? right. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that? What you saw is this uh, um, inside of Fukushima, there was a huge di nuclear disaster, as you may know. This tsunami hit this area, then they lost the power. So at this uh, nuclear uh, power plant, there was an uh, uh, explosion, hydrogen explosion. And that spread the radiation all over the Fukushima, and it actually reached to Tokyo, too. So uh, this town of Futaba, they are a ground zero town, which is like a, they, they have the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. So they are the closest to the power plant. So they have to evacuate. But uh, they didn't evacuate close, the somewhere close. They have to evacuate 250 kilometers away, which is almost Tokyo. Then they need to stay there. They they actually entire town moved into this uh, abandoned school. It was a high school, and so everybody has to live there in the classroom. And you remember, there's an art room. So every every room has got a name, art 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 room or or teachers room or or the music room or so. They, then every room has got a maybe a twenty to thirty residents in. So there's no privacy. It's uh, that's the evacuation life, like, you know, as refugees. With with so many residents, was mm. it difficult for you to decide which family to follow? Um, so I'm always interested uh, in the depicting community. So like I don't really make okay who I want to focus on, then who's gonna be the main character of the movie. Like when I try to make movies, like I try to make the community. So how I thought about this movie wa the, uh, was that how I can depict the community of this town. Mm -hmm. So I, want, I focused on the young people or uh, the one couple with the children. Then I chose one old couple and uh, I chose one person who don't have a, uh, any family, so like a lonely person. So try to make a balance. And, and the mayor the, was yeah. very important. And also episode. the mayor. Yeah. I chose the mayor, the mayor of the town. Mm -hmm. So try to, so by choosing those uh, limited numbers of people, tr I try to make this uh, whole community. Mm -hmm. And then... A microcosm of, microcosm. of the yeah. whole community. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then this person, uh, the... Yuichi is the especially the one like I, uh, very emotional in the when he moved into this uh, evacuation zone, which has the high radiation level. The because the when tsunami hit, uh, there are many people died, but the, at the same time there's a, this nuclear disaster happened. So the um, there is no rescue <laughs> there because they rescue people couldn't come in. So there are lots of dead bodies left. 
And uh, one month later, like, uh, they have to come in with uh, these uh, white suits and then rescue crew came in and then they collected all those dead bodies. So there are lots of uh, tragedy. There were lots of tragedy was there. And then, so Yuichi was this, uh, one of those people who hated, hated this nuclear disaster because the, if there were not nuclear disaster, he could come to, he thought he could come in right away, right after the tsunami, so he could save his mom. But because of a disaster, he couldn't come in, so that's why like, his mother died. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So now um, let's talk about Cold Bloom. <coughs> Cold Bloom is the feature film that you made right after the disaster. Do those two uh, uh, projects uh, came in parallel ideas, or you were working on one and then writing the script for another? How 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 did you work out those two projects? Um. To be honest with you, I was gonna make Cold Broom when tsunami hit. Actually, it was like a two or three weeks before the uh, actual first day of the production. Wow! So okay. the entire production was halted, uh -huh. stopped, and then because you you can imagine uh, two weeks or three weeks before the production, that means you spend a lot of money already. Yes. You book the crew and the casting and the location and the, you know all the production crew, so actually we lost half of the budget. Wow, mm -hmm. that was a disaster to us actually. Yes, it's a, that that's the my, my March 11 disaster. <laughs> 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 I lost the film pretty mm -hmm, much, mm -hmm. so I have to give up the production of the film actually because we lost the uh, the location which is called the city. It's called of Hitachi. That's a uh, uh, northeast side of Japan, so that's where the tsunami really hit. Mm -hmm. So of course you cannot really shoot there anymore because the it's uh, there, there's a the real disaster happened over there. Then that's why like, I started shooting a nuclear nation. Then it took a year for me to finish the nuclear nation. Then while I was making nuclear nation, then there's another producer came up to me. You know what? I I know you lost a half of the budget, but we're gonna put another half of it so that we can make a movie. He's your angel. Yeah, he was the angel. So then a year later, I made this uh, uh, mm. uh, movie called Broom. And uh, this is, a, you'll see, uh, I, made, I made a different approach mm. to the disaster. Yes, it's more of a more personal approach. Yes. yes. The Cold Broom is a film about a woman who fall in love with the guy who killed her husband. So one day, his, her husband got killed uh, because of some accident at the uh, uh, factory she's working for. And then, so she really hated this killer. But uh, after the funeral and after, the, uh, actually this killer guy was working for, for the same factory with her. So she, he was uh, her colleague. And then little by little, she hated him and she wanted to kill him at the first, at the beginning. But little by little, the, the facts start to reveal and which was pretty much the accident. It was not his will and it was, uh, you know, caused by, he, not his mistake, but the mistake of the, actually the organization of the factory, the management side. So the, when the time passes, little by little, her hate starts changing and she starts understanding actually because of this accident he's the one also suffering so she shared the suffering with him so mm -hmm. little by little she starts feeling a sympathy so this hate she had starts to change little by little so you'll mm -hmm. see so so tell us do you have common themes that you explore in all your films um, besides the cherry blossoms <laughs> so uh I made this film, uh, I wrote this script by myself and uh, um, trying to depict this emptiness people have felt after March 11 the tsunami and the uh, uh, nuclear disaster. There are lots of people who lost loved ones by tsunami and uh, mm -hmm. then it's, I, I think the fiction is the media who you really need a distance from what's going on. And you have to make it abstractize, make it a little bit abstract. So 
you if you try to show the uh, drama the who the, the family drama who the loved ones got hit by the tsunami and then people are really grieving from it it's too direct and uh, just imagine like there's a huge tsunami or the, maybe let's say earthquake and hit hong kong and then the buildings collapsed and the people many people died then someone else came up to you say oh look we're going to make a movie about your father or mother then you must you must be very sad and it it's really it it, it feels like sometimes in, insulting because it's too close so uh, there are so many people who are really uh, if this huge magnitude of the disaster happened to you or your, your country, lots of pe people are still feeling uh, grief. So it's very difficult to fictionalize it because it's, uh, it's uh, n because number one, it's a, ma it's a money-making system, it's a capitalism, it's a movie, it's an industry. So like, people may say, okay, you're making money out of my grief or my tragedy that my family died. And also someone also may say, it's totally wrong. It's so, you know, different from the reality. Many people would come and say so. And that happened in Japan too. Some people, some filmmakers depicted a nuclear disaster or tsunami. And then, you know, if the directing is wrong or, you know, actually this is the nature of the fiction. Even like you say, let's say, let's, for example, like you depict this person was a very gentle, nice guy, but then uh, based on the reality, but uh, someone may come up and say, oh, you know, like I knew this person in real because I was a friend of him and he was not really nice, gentle like that, like he was very harsh to me or, you know, that could happen. So if the reality is too close, then to deal with the, the uh, phenomena or the I issue as the fiction become very difficult. So I, I would say the fiction needs a distance. And then, um, and, and in a good way, in a good yes. way. So like when I made a cold broom, I thought it's the, the lot, the sense many, of loss. Yes, sense of loss. The many Japanese people felt this sense of loss and then many people were feeling this kind of huge hole vanity inside their uh, emotion mm -hmm. and uh, I thought maybe like I can make a movie people can feel this vanity and the hole in their heart so I made the this story about the woman who lost her husband and then she doesn't know how to deal with this loss right yeah. it's a very hopeful film yes so yes. so you know so like uh, even you have a loss you can feel the hope at the end mm -hmm. So that's that's how I took it. So like a, you know, taking a distance from the reality, but still people can feel s the sympathy with what's going on in the reality and what's going on in, inside the film. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm just going to ask one last question and then I'll open to the floor. And this is a, a selfish question. Okay. I have to confess, because you studied film at School of Visual Arts in New York, and I teach film here. So my question is, did you learn anything from your professors? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if That's you didn't learn anything, it's OK, OK. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I got to be honest with you. I didn't learn anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually. Um, that's a joke. Actually, I, I learned a lot. One thing I learned a lot was that editing. The, my uh, thesis advisor was an editor, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I made a feature film, which is going to be shown later. It's called Echoes. It's a 72-minute film. Mm -hmm. And then it was supposed to be a two-hour movie. Uh -huh. And then when I put it together, it didn't work. And I didn't know how, why it didn't work. It, it's just uh, uh, I didn't know the reason. But uh, one day he said, OK, cut this, cut this, cut this out. And then at the beginning, I thought, wow, you know, you are crazy. I, I, you, do you know like, how many days I shot this scene and that scene? So like, I was so close to the material. I couldn't have the objective view. Yeah. And he did. And he said, cut this out. And then, you know, nowadays, you are not really editing on a Steam Deck on a 16, you know. Uh, now, like, you can work on Avid or Final Cut. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And that was the early day, like when I made a student film, like it was 2001. And then that was the kind of shifting era from uh, you edit on the film to the uh, digital. digital. And then I was uh, editing on Avid. Uh, that's a former style of uh, uh, the final cut. And then, you know, so you can undo very easy, right? So like, I just, uh, you know, as a test, I did, I cut it all. Then I saw the movie on the big screen and then for the, as a test and then I thought, wow, it's great. It looks fantastic. And uh, so, you know, sometimes it's good like uh, have a, some, someone else <coughs> has got a, a objective view and then tell you, give you some advice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the experience. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, um, do you want to show a little bit of your, uh, of your thesis film? Sure. How about uh, that? Yeah. Sure, why not? It's a road movie about this young girl uh, living in East Village. This is a pretty much hippie town back then in the late, late 1990s. Okay. And uh, there's a lot, lots of rough people around in the area, as you know, like in New York. Crack yes, was, <laughs> was there. Yes. yes. And uh, uh, this is about this girl who doesn't have uh, the job or anything, so like, she's uh, stealing a lot of many things. And the first scene, like, you saw like, she's stealing money. And one day she was stealing some uh, someone's purse at the uh, uh, club uh, when like, she was dancing, and, uh, you know, the disco music, and uh, she kind of stole a bag from one girl. Then within that girl uh, bag, Actually, she found an old picture of herself with the person she doesn't know. And then that, that starts the mystery of her family uh, secret, and which was that uh, she had a sister which she didn't know. And she found this picture within this bag. So she tried to find a person who, you know, from who like, she stole the bag. <laughs> But she thought she, that, that could be her sister or something. And so this becomes her road trip. And then she goes down to, from New York, this is a story in taking place in New York, and she took a road trip down to the Virginia, which is the south side of the United States, and to meet her mother. And uh, she actually escaped her home when she was a teenager, and she hates her mother, so there's a lot of family drama. But uh, basically, her mother was hiding she actually got married with someone else before and she had another child and so the sister she had a sister and so she it's a kind of a road trip movie she's uh, uh like revealing the family history and uh, that was the uh story and then it was shot in uh, 20 days with the 60 millimeter mm -hmm. and with the seven people crew including me and uh, everyone was 
you know, pretty much American students and the um, cast was American. And uh, we didn't have any money. Like it was the budget was like uh, $25,000 US, USD, US dollars. That, was that enough just to you know purchase the film stop? Actually, look, it's, I had a little scholarship from oh. the school, so they gave me the uh, film stock, mm -hmm. so that was good. But uh, you know, everyone, everyone's uh, no pay, and uh, volunteer, and then we, we <laughs> and uh, including my girlfriend back then. Now she's my wife, but uh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's uh, she was uh, cooking. She was a craft service. And, uh, <laughs> craft service. Yeah. Yes, she was making <laughs> spaghetti every day for this uh, seven or eight people crew, and then <laughs> yes. yes, and mm -hmm. then actually, like I still remember the budget, the budget for the food of the crew. It's in including the breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then the. Uh, the budget for the one person per day is one dollar. <laughs> How can you manage? That's pretty good. Right? Yes, very good. So like uh, if you have a seven to eight people, then one day that uh, you have eight dollar a day. So <laughs> so like, she had to put together, like she bought like, a super cheap bread or the spaghetti <laughs> and then cook together and then you have to feed her in you know, the breakfast and the lunch and and, and and that's why you married her. Yeah. yeah. That's why. <laughs> That's why. That's why like, I liked her a lot. And uh, we, we also like, shot the films in the very rough neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So it was very dangerous sometimes. But uh, also there are lots of homeless people there. Yeah. And there's one day like, we had a lunchtime and, uh, in the, on the street. And uh, we had this craft service. And uh, my you know, girlfriend was like, feeding. And then there's, uh, my crew was uh, lining up and then we were waiting. And then somehow like, there's the lines are so long. <laughs> And uh, actually, you know, we don't know why. And then look, there are some homeless people to join in too. And then you can then, use them as an extra. Yes, well. yes, yes, right. <laughs> and uh, there's a guy like I still remember the Max. That he's a so, so nice guy, and he did the sound and the boom, and he did everything. And he he was so nice. So he was like, a, there's a homeless guy came over. So okay, okay, go ahead eat. And so he was the, the the end of the line. And I was like, okay, Max, you have to eat. We have to, we have to shoot. And then, you know, we, you, I was yelling at him, but he was like, you know, like, just let's feed them. So we had an extra long lunch break on that day. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, we have some time. So uh, please feel free to ask questions, especially if you have uh, seen Atushi's new film that was in the film festival. How many of you have seen the film? Yes, please. Uh, it's a very different film than the films that we have seen here, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> Feel free to ask questions. Yes, please. Uh, I actually have a question about the NMB 48 film, which I saw yesterday and enjoyed very much. Um, I wanted to know how you got the idea uh, for the film and how you approached it, particularly since a different director did the documentary trilogy on AKB 48 not too long ago. Um. Uh, I was not really interested in the idols at all. As you see, that I was shooting documentaries in Fukushima, pretty much. And then this uh, Akimoto Yasushi, that's the producer, the mastermind of this uh, AKB48 group, he's a producer. And also he's the songwriter of all the songs of AKB48 AKB and NMB48. So this Nuclear Nation, my movie, and then that was back then, like at the early 2015. And then they are in the midst of a discussion that they made four or five documentaries about AKB48 and SKE48. Then they want to make another one for the NMB48. But they, they all look the same, you know? <laughs> so they had a difficulty to differentiate. OK, we can, we're going to make it something different. So how can we do, you know, we gotta do something drastic. Maybe we have, we have to have someone who doesn't have any idea about the idols and make, make him, you know, make a movie. That's why he approached me, actually. <laughs> so that's uh, when this offer came to me, I was like, what? You know, <laughs> because I don't even knew the, uh, uh, a name of a girl, one girl. I, I didn't know anyone. 
So I, you know, actually, because I didn't know anyone in the AKB48, or I didn't know anyone in the NMB48. So I was like, okay, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about, but uh, if you uh, agree with the idea, I will make a documentary from outsider's point of view and immersing into this community of idols. Because I, I like the making a movies about the community. Not the focusing on one person, but making a big group of people. Like um, I, I made this uh, nuclear nation. Mm -hmm. Then if you like this approach, then I would make a movie. Then he said, fine. So this is uh, pretty much the, the biggest difference from other documentaries of AKB48 and other idol movies are that this is not for the uh, idol geeks. It's for the uh, first timer, for the outsiders. Yeah, so that's the uh, approach I, I chose. Yeah. Yes, um, another question? I cannot image a director who documented a tsunami than to the NMB48. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but how you prepare? How many days with, uh, you prepare to with them and how to, to choose? Because you have, uh, I think it's four or five Main direct main character inside and the mm -hmm. captains, vice captain, and also the some losers or some as in comp competitions. Mm. Then how to to choose the wh which girls you want to be? Even you wanted to have the community, there's some main direct character inside. So how to to choose it? Or how many films? Uh, how many hours you you filmed it? But uh, then you choose those girls as you are. I see. Um, how can I start? Um, you know, like it's, I shot uh, 300 hours of the film. And then also the AKB48 all, uh, have all the footage from the previous years. Like they had a 12 hours of, a 1200 hours of footage. <laughs> because like it's, uh, this, is a, this was the fifth year of them and I shot the eight months. I, I, I went there to the Osaka, uh, you know, I live in Tokyo and the Tokyo and Osaka is a five kilometer, uh, 500 kilometer away. So I had to take a bullet train to go to Osaka. And then I went there 10 times a, a month. So like a, once in a three day or something, I had to commute to the Osaka and shoot there, then come back to the Tokyo. And uh, um, since like you, uh, many of you are film students, I think maybe I'm, I'm going to talk about the production side. Uh, when I make a new film or new genre film, uh, I try to put myself in the situation that I can make mistakes. You know, I try to have an allowance. Uh, I try to have extra time so that I can make mistakes and I can change a little bit. So uh, what I did is that I said, OK, we're going to have an eight-month shoot. But uh, I'm going to stop editing maybe after uh, two months. So I'm going to be editing and shooting you know, at the same time. So I have a, in that case, then I have uh, 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 you know, six months of editing. Usually look at the, the documentaries of this. Sometimes look at the producer would say, okay, you have just two months or three months to edit and you gotta finish it. Then I thought, you know, I cannot do it because I have no idea what I'm gonna do and I need a time to figure out. So that's why like, I, kind, I said, we're gonna be shooting, but we're gonna stop editing early. But uh, instead, it's, uh, you, you know, of course it's gonna cost. So, you know, because okay, you have to pay to the editor and you have to book the editing room and that's gonna cost money. So I said, okay, I, I'm gonna edit by, by myself at the beginning. So, so you don't need to pay the, for the six months, the editing room and then, you know, for the editor. But uh, then the last extensive period, like the last two months was, and then one month for the post-production, the uh, color correcting and then sound mix, then I have a professionals, the editors and the uh, professional color collector, color list and the sound mixers. So in that way, I have a time to, for me to figure out first four months and edit by myself. And uh, for, you know, uh, on the same token, uh, I did uh, for the shooting. Uh, for the nuclear nation, I shot by myself. 
And then I talked to the producer of uh, this NMB48. At the beginning, first two months, I'm gonna shoot by myself. Then after that, I'm gonna start hiring the uh, cameraman, camera guy, and then we're gonna start shooting. And because the, uh, from the experience with Nuclear Nation, I know I'm okay cameraman. <laughs> you know, I'm not super good. You know, like I, I think it's uh, the professional camera guy is much, much better. But uh, also the, from the experience, I know at the beginning, the, the, you don't know what you're doing. You are figuring out, you are like looking around and you really don't, you have no idea what you're doing. So most likely, you're not gonna use it anyway. So it's so stupid to spend the money to, for the camera at the, at the beginning. So it's much better, you just do it by yourself at the beginning and you look around and you shoot a bunch of stuff anyway, you're not gonna use it because you're, you're, you have no idea what you're doing. Then after three months or four months, then you start knowing, ah, this, is the, this girl would be interesting, that girl is interesting. So you, you little by little, you have a focus. Then that's when like, you're going you're gonna to bring the cameraman, then say, shoot that and shoot that, then you can direct it. So I, I think for me, the, the very important uh, thing about the documentary filmmaking is that the scheduling. You make a schedule that allow you mistakes. So you have a time to figure out. You don't really need to, okay, you have to get the super beautiful shot right now, but uh, no, that's not gonna happen. You know, so you, you, it takes time. It's sort of like part research and part exploring the themes yes, and the yes. characters and trying yeah. to find what is the story you want to tell. Yeah, I there. always feel like it's a, um, that process I do for the fiction film is when I'm writing. Mm. You can spend a lot of time in writing and you, you're trying to figure out what you really want to do in the film. And that's a research and you know, uh, having a different uh, draft. Yes. And then documentary filmmaking, it's when you're shooting, you are doing the research and the making uh, uh, many drafts. So it's, 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 it's a writing process actually. Yeah. And, and it's funny, a lot of the projects you work on after a little while, the project takes on a life of its own. Right. And then you feel like the, the project is talking to you now, it's a life. And right. then it will lead you to certain direction, right. in a way, right? So the first couple of months is that time mm -hmm. for you to get really, to, to get the project to, to, come, to come alive, yeah, in come a way, to life. yes. Yes, right. I think so. Okay, I hope that answered your question, yes. Usually other documentary of this uh, AKB48 like, uh, focus on the popular girls who's the cutest or beautiful or, or you know, those sexy. Or, but uh, actually, the, what we focused on is the girls at the bottom, you know, who are deciding to quit or leave and what's gonna happen to them. So we try to show the girls on the top, girls at the bottom, who's on the verge of uh, quitting or who are the coming to the next, uh, ace or the second place or third place, so you can see the kind of uh, dynamics of the community. You also follow one girl where you actually see her family. Yes. I remember, yes. Yes, right. family so, side is, yes. Uh, was very important because, the, um, you know, you, you actually, you see how much they are really sacrificing. It's, it's very intense, uh, um, you know, world. In intense industry, so also very competitive. Today, very right? competitive, so you have yeah. to sacrifice many things. Mm -hmm. You can't go to school much, yeah. and actually, um, they are forbidden to have boyfriends. Yes, one of the girls actually in NFB was kicked out because she had a boyfriend. Yes, right? yes, right. Anyway, okay. Um, another question. Um, uh, Japanese or, uh, original title is "Futaba kara toku hanarete." It means uh, keeping away far from Futaba, yeah. but the English title is the uh, Nuclear Nation, uh, totally different, no? And uh, I feel, in my impression, uh, titled uh, Nuclear Nation contains any, your uh, opinion or anger t towards our, our Japanese government. So how and why you hit up on the uh, English title? Um, actually, like it's, uh, I came with the English title first. Um, 
you know, when this disaster happened, I thought Japan is a nuclear nation, pretty much, because they suffered from Hiroshima, Nagasaki, now Fukushima, and, and you have radiation all over the nation. So that's I thought it's maybe, you know, this is a nuclear nation. That's the title I came about like from the very beginning of the production. Then I went to the Berlinale, the Berlin Film Festival, and we had a world premiere. Then I was going to show this film in Japan saying the nuclear nation. Then some people say, you know, the Japanese people are so bad with English, so when you say nuclear nation in Japanese, then, you know, uh, in an English accent, they, they, they don't get it. They don't understand it. So I tried to come up with uh, Japanese translation. But when you translate word by word, it, you say, um, Kaku no kuni in Japanese meaning nuclear nation, then it, it, it doesn't sound juicy either. So I have to come up with a different name. You know, the, for Hollywood films, that actually that happens all the time. You have a different uh, uh, name, title in Japanese. So I'm, I, I'm pretty sure the same in here too, in Hong Kong and Ch China too. So, so that's why like, we had a different names. And then Futaba kara toku hanarete, in Japanese, it means far from, uh, far from Futaba. It, uh, it means that the people from Futaba town evacuated their home far away to Tokyo. And also, it has a double meanings. Um, uh, the Tokyo people actually used all the electricity from Fukushima. Mm -hmm. So it has a double meaning. Like it's a, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. thought it's, it works to the Japanese audience better than saying a nuclear nation. Yeah, one more question. Yes? How do you, uh, how, how, how would you approach them in a way that they would actually tell the actual threat or tell the thing that would... Are you talking about the NMB48 documentary or generally speaking? Generally speaking, especially in this film because there's so many different people and also a lot of things that could, that were told in the f film itself could be, uh, could be affecting their career in some uh -huh. way. Like how 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 would that turn out? Like especially like the last scene in the movie that could do a lot of impact right. to that girl, right? For example, how how do you approach that? Um, you have to gain the trust, their trust first. But I think that sounds really kind of right. But uh, to be honest, actually, you just let them ignore us you make the situation that we are, the camera is around all the time, so they don't really care. So you make that kind of a condition. So first they say, oh, look, there's a camera, we have to show something really nice to them, then it's gonna be on the film. But uh, you know, like if you are there every day, they become, they don't really care, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's when they actually bring down their guard and they, they are, much less protective, and they they show their own, you know, their, their themselves, and uh, that's when I start rolling the camera, actually. So, uh, you know, I don't really roll the camera, but uh, even like I'm not rolling the camera, I I have the camera here, <laughs> so they know there's a camera, and then whenever I feel like it, I just roll it. But uh, most of the time, like it's actually I I have the camera to make themselves comfortable with the presence of the camera and then they ignore us. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, well thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.